Conservation Ag Update is brought to you by Montag Manufacturing. Welcome to the National Farm Machinery Show here in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm Noah Newman, and this is the backdrop for this special edition of Conservation Ag Update. We'll be moving around the show throughout the program. But let's kick things off with our lead story here. It took place in Wisconsin at the Dodge County Farmers Annual Soil Health Expo. They had a, a lot of great speakers, including Wisconsin Ag Professor Jeff Hadachek, who talked about the long-term benefits of implementing a winter wheat in your corn and soybean rotation. Here's a taste of what he had to say. It really is a sort of staggered effect where um, you maybe see down years and you maybe see um, lower returns in that, those wheat years, but then um, in that those, those years in the following wheat uh, into the rotation, um, you really see benefits into, into the corn and, and soy. And so um, all of this to say is that um, when, when we're implementing conservation practices, whether it's introducing uh, conservation cropping, um, introducing cover crops, uh, introducing other alternative strategies that, that do have costs associated with them. I think it's important to um, consider the, the time span, of maybe say 20 to 30 years uh, when we think about implementing these systems rather than just the year to year returns. Um, because sometimes those year to year returns will sort of shade the fact that you're getting benefits in some of those, those off years. All right, good stuff there. More from that meeting in just a bit, but now we're here with Brandon Summers in the Beck's Practical Farm Research Insight Center here. You just did a, a round table discussion. How much do you enjoy getting out here and, and sharing some of the results from the uh, 2023 research? Yeah, this is one of the most fun things we do is just come out and share everything that we worked hard on this summer. Uh, it's really gratifying for all of us to be able to share it with customers and see it get taken to the field. And one of the questions you got here that I thought really stood out is, Everything you know from this research book, given that if you had an unlimited budget, what's going on your ultimate planner? And in this case, a lot of our audience, they're no tillers and strip tillers. So what would go on your ultimate planner with an unlimited budget? Yeah, so that is a, that's a tough question because there's a lot of good options out there, but I think there's two things I think are tied for number one. Uh, first is downforce. Hydraulic downforce is really kind of changed the game, especially for no-till. Being able to change uh, that downforce as the planter's going across the field multiple times within a second, that's making a big difference. Even in our small plots of being three to 400 feet long, we're seeing advantages in it, and that's pretty, usually some fairly consistent ground. Uh, number two is two by two by two, uh, being able to put some nitrogen down right next to where that plant needs it uh, to get that plant off to the best start we can. I think is really key. Uh, those two are probably my top one. Uh, to go to number two, I think having a good meter system is key. We wanna have good singulation out there, get good placement of that seed. Um, and when I say metering system, that kind of goes into having something like a speed tube on there. Being able to control that drop all the way till that seed gets in the ground. You know, cause from that point on, we do nothing but lose yield potential. So let's get it set uh, up for the best yield potential we had get. Um, and then number three, I think is closing wheels, uh, especially in a no-till situation, that can make a big difference. We wanna get that seed trench closed, protect that seed, get good seed to foil contact. It's good for germination, keeps some of the pests out of the trench. Um, and all the testing we've done, and we've tested a lot of different closing wheels, anything we put on there seems to be better than just that standard rubber tire closing system that we typically see. There you go, the ultimate planner, if you have an unlimited budget from Brandon here, and we're gonna be breaking down the research from this book here in the coming weeks on notillfarmer.com. So Brandon, thanks for taking the time to do this, we appreciate it. Thank you. Right now, let's send it back to the studio. McCain Vogel standing by with today's Cover Crop Connection. Thanks, Noah. McCain Vogel here with this week's Cover Crop Connection. This week, check out some advice from Merlin, Ontario no-tiller Blake Vince on how to go about putting together a multi-species cover crop mix. First, I like to use a ballpoint pen, and I like to reference the seed size spectrum because seeds inevitably are smaller and larger. So at the clicker end of the ballpoint pen, if you can imagine a seed that's large like a fava bean, and at the opposite end where the ballpoint is of that pen, you would have a seed in there like canola or kale, something that's very small or facilia. And in the medium of that range would be a seed like soybeans. So people inevitably will ask me, well, how can you plant all of this diverse blend without sort of settling out in your seed or seed plant or your box of your drill or whatever? 
and I set the drill based on the size of the average seed in the blend, which is typically soybeans. So you just look at your chart for your specific planter. And if you want to have 50 pounds of soybeans, you just open up the opening based on what the book would say or the, the chart as it pertains to your drill or your air seeder. And it's very, very easy to do with that. Stay tuned for an upcoming No-Till Farmer article with more tips and info from Blake Vince regarding best practices for multi-species cover crop mixes. That's all for this week's Cover Crop Connection. Until next time, back to you, Noah. Thank you very much, McCain. We've moved over to the John Deere booth here now because our next story is about philanthropist and no-till advocate Howard Buffett, who spearheaded a movement that sent over 100 pieces of equipment to farmers in Ukraine, many of which are like these John Deere models here behind me. And Buffett was actually at the National No Tillage Conference last month to talk about some of his worldwide humanitarian efforts and the role that conservation ag plays in it. You know, we were talking a little earlier about, you know, when you start talking cover crops in Africa, you know, people think you're a little crazy because how could they grow anything that they weren't gonna eat and, uh, or use for cattle, but primarily eat. So it's an uphill battle in terms of, of trying to fit some of those things into uh, you know, a production system. And, and it's not much of a system in some places, but we're doing a project in Rwanda. We're probably 11, 12 years into it. We have taken the farmer's income and increased it by 15 times. And we now in the last, I'd say three years now, have gotten some farmers to uh, begin to use uh, more or less no-till. It's very hard to talk about cover crops still over there, and even in this environment. Um, but we're making progress on it. And, uh, you know, in Central America, we've made a lot of progress with it. It's really interesting. Um, and sometimes it has to do with the environment, um, you know, uh, what's available. I mean, a lot of things, you know, what can you export? So what are your sales opportunities? Um, but, you know, everywhere we go, we try to make sure we can apply as many principles of conservation ag as we can. And, you know, people come up with regenerative ag and all these other, you know, names, and I just still call it conservation ag because that's what it is. And through his foundation, Buffett was able to bring four farmers from Ukraine to the National No Tillage Conference to listen to his presentation. So pretty cool stuff there. All right, we have moved on to the New Holland booth, and we are in front of this massive CR11 combine. And one of the unique features on this is right there, the IntelliSpread system. That is what that is called. Now it automates the spreading control to ensure even residue coverage behind the combine. So we see a lot of this cutting edge technology here at the show. And when you talk about technology, automation, autonomy, question is, you know, how quickly are, are you gonna use it on your farm? Well, I asked no-tillers Tim Norris and Joe Hamilton that exact question at the Precision Farming Dealer Summit last month. Here's a taste of what they had to say. Last year, we had a fence on the farm, um, and we uh, had a group from Brazil coming up, and Ag Infotech brought uh, this Sabanto fence out, and we got to uh, mow 40 acres of pasture with it, and it was really neat to see. So I'm really looking forward to it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to afford it if you have to have a brand new tractor and uh, the technology on top of that, but if it will retrofit to tractors that are 10, 15 years old, I could see it having a fit. Joe, is it autonomy, does it seem like a science fiction movie to you, or is it pretty close to having a place on your farm? No, I think it's, it's close. If Tesla can create a self-driving car that can drive down the highway with all the unknowns and variables um, present on the highway, why can't we make a tractor that drives itself in the field? Um, the, I would use it as a time savings. If, if I can spray 90 acres an hour sitting in the sprayer, I don't wanna be able to spray 90 acres an hour standing by the side of the field babysitting the autonomous sprayer. It, it has to be a time savings for me, but with, with weather events, Every year, um, shortening my planting window. A lot of times I'm, I'm riding the planter one day and spraying the next. And if I have 10 good days to plant and I just burn up one of those because I had to get out of the planter and get in the sprayer, um, that's it's very inefficient for me in my operation. Um, I, I think autonomy will take a place on its farm, but just like Tim said, it's, it's gonna be cost. I, I don't cover 25,000 acres, I cover 2,500. So it has to be a cost-effective solution for me. Hi atop this Great Plains Planner here for our video of the week, because it's about planning, and it's about the flag test, which many of you have probably heard of, but 
What exactly is it and how can it help you detect uneven emergence? Well, here's Andy Waters from Linko Precision in Central Illinois to explain what the flag test is. So the flag test is essentially you've got different colored or different marked day flags. Um, so you got day one, two, three, and four. And um, you basically go out like, uh, let's say this is Monday at eight o'clock, go out at Monday at eight o'clock and I mark any plants that are emerged with the red flag. Then I'll come back on day two at eight o'clock and any plants that were not already marked that are up now, I'll mark with a day two. And I'm measuring out, you know, 17 on 30 inch rows, 17 foot, five inches. And then day three, I'll come back with another flag and mark any plants that are day three. So um, you can see the consistency of emergence like we talked about. You lose basically 8% if it emerges after 24 hours. After 36 hours, you're losing 30 something percent. And after uh, 48 hours, you're losing 68%. So um, you can see how much of an effect that would take. And ideally you have all one color. It's all, you know, day one, but very, very rarely do I see that. Very rarely do I ever see, um, actually on a 36,000 population, I see 36,000. Usually it's 34, 33, something like that. And that'll wrap up this week's edition of Conservation Ag Update. Hey, if you have a story idea or something you wanna see on the program, shoot me an email at innewman at lespub.com. It seems like everyone's gone home. I just heard an announcement on the speaker. We gotta get out of here. So we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for the National Farm Machinery Show in Louisville.